Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Allen, and I am the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's virtual lunch bite. The American Revolution Institute promotes the knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions, and other historical programs, advocating preservation, and providing resources to classrooms. Since 1938, the Society of the Cincinnati has done this work from its headquarters, Anderson House, a national historic landmark finished in 1905 as the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson in Washington, D.C. Today's Lunch Bite features the American Revolution's in Today's Lunch Bite features the American Revolution Institute's Research Services Librarian, Rachel Nellis, discussing Mercy Otis Warren's poems, dramatic and miscellaneous from our library collections. Mercy Otis Warren was a prolific writer, especially in correspondence, and was a leading propagandist for the Patriot cause. According to John Adams, Warren was the most accomplished lady in America. Her 1790 publication, Poems, Dramatic and Miscellaneous, contains two plays and several allegorical or satirical poems on the revolution that were dedicated to George Washington and praised by Alexander Hamilton. This lunch bite will focus on Warren as a patriot, poet, and historian through her published works and correspondence. Rachel Nellis is the Research Services Librarian at the American Revolution Institute where she facilitates use of the reading room along with the many resources within the library. Originally from Illinois, Rachel attended the University of Texas at Austin and earned her master's degree in information studies with a concentration in archives in 2016. After moving to Washington, D.C. that same year, she was an intern at NPR before serving as an archivist at the Cosmos Club, which is directly across from our headquarters here at Anderson House. Rachel joined the professional staff of the American Revolution Institute in July of 2019, and one of Rachel's major projects here has been building and maintaining the Institute's digital library. So if you've accessed the large digital library on our website recently, you have Rachel to thank for that. Uh, so with that introduction, please join me in welcoming Rachel Nellis. Thanks, Andrew, for that lovely introduction. Mercy Otis Warren is probably most well known for her 1805 publication, History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution. But that wasn't her first foray into writing or political thought. Mercy Otis Warren has become, along with her contemporaries like Abigail Adams, an example of the Republican motherhood concept. The idea that women and mothers should uphold Republican ideals and pass on their values to their children to ensure good and active citizens. Today I'll be sharing about the life and times of Mercy through her writings, and in particular a scarce volume of poetry that our library has only recently acquired in November of 2021. Mercy Otis Warren's Poems, Dramatic and Miscellaneous, published in 1790 in Boston. Mercy Otis was born in Barnstable, Massachusetts in September 1728 as the third of 13 children to James Otis and Mary Allen Otis. Although Mercy was not allowed to receive a formal education, she did sit in on her brother's lessons with her uncle, Reverend Jonathan Russell, as their tutor. Mercy and her brother, James Otis, or Jemmy as he was lovingly called, were especially close and Jemmy advocated for Mercy's continuing education throughout her young adulthood and teenage years. With her brothers, Mercy studied Greek and Roman literature, learned ancient and modern history, studied English authors such as Shakespeare, Pope, and Milton, and learned to write. Alexander Pope was a great influence on Mercy as you'll find throughout her work. Mercy was always surrounded by political life. For one, being from Massachusetts outside of Boston, created a fiercely political atmosphere. Secondly, her father, James Otis, was an attorney who was elected to the Massachusetts legislature in 1745, and her brother, James Jr., after his graduation at Harvard in 1743, was a well-known political activist who was a leading mind behind formulating the colonists' grievances against Britain in the 1760s and coined the phrase, taxation without representation is tyranny. This phrase made Jemmy a hero among revolutionaries. And then she met her husband, James Warren, during Jemmy's graduation at Harvard, where the two men were classmates. 
She and James Warren were friends for a decade before they married, and he, more than anyone, supported her writing and political activities. At one time, he praised her for her mind possessed of masculine genius well stocked with learning. It seems unusual for the time that so many men would have been this supportive of Mercy's writing pursuits, and it may have affected the opinions she put in her prose. Mercy married James Warren in 1754, who at the time was a merchant and a farmer, but would go on to serve in the Massachusetts legislature from 1766 to 1778 and serve in the Continental Army. She moved to Plymouth, Massachusetts, halfway between Barnstable and Boston, and had five children between 1757 and 1766. Only two of them would live past Mercy. Mercy and James hosted salons in their Plymouth home to gather the leading patriots of the day, including John and Samuel Adams. Besides hosting in Plymouth, Mercy was a prolific correspondent, having long, meaningful parlays with John and Abigail Adams and Catherine Macaulay, the famed British historian and political writer, among many others. Early in the Revolutionary Era in the 1760s, the Massachusetts Patriots had become increasingly disillusioned with Thomas Hutchinson, the colonial governor. The Warrens led a crusade against Hutchinson, leading to Mercy anonymously publishing the play, The Adulateur, in 1772 as a response to Hutchinson's poor handling of the Boston Massacre. The Adulateur is a satirical play that was released in two installments in the Massachusetts Spy newspaper. Inspired by the Republican Rome, and her inner circle in Massachusetts, Mercy created a world with a villainous, corrupt governor, Rapatio, Hutchinson, and revolutionaries, Brutus, her brother, James Otis Jr., Rusticus, her husband, James Warren, and Hortensius, John Adams. The play ends with a warning from Brutus and a prediction from Mercy. Yes, the wished for period may soon arrive when murders, blood and carnage shall crimson all these streets, when their poor country shall lose her richest blood forged at heaven. And may these monsters find their glories fade, crushed in the ruins they themselves have made, while thou my country shall again revive, shake off misfortune and through ages live. Between 1772 and 1790, Mercy is attributed as the author of the following plays, published anonymously. The Defeat in 1773, The Group in 1775, Blockheads in 1776, and The Motley Assembly in 1779. In 1788, she published under the pen name, A Columbian Patriot, Observations on the New Constitution. Mercy and James had become anti-federalists by the time of the Constitutional Convention, meaning they avidly opposed the ratification of the Constitution due to its emphasis on a strong central government. Mercy lists 18 points of contention with the Constitution, including the lack of a Bill of Rights. There is no provision by a Bill of Rights to guard against the dangerous encroachments of power in too many instances to be named. This pamphlet would alienate them from some of their inner circle, including Federalist John Adams. In 1790, Mercy finally published under her own name, Poems Dramatic and Miscellaneous contains two plays, The Sack of Rome and The Ladies of Castile, and 18 poems. Previously, Mercy probably published anonymously for a couple of reasons. Firstly, to avoid retaliation from the British, and secondly, because she was a female writer who wanted the readers to read her work based on its merits and message instead of focusing on the fact that she was a woman. The title page triumphantly displays her name, Poems Dramatic and Miscellaneous by Mrs. M. Warren, with a quote from Alexander Pope's Epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. "'Tis a stranger sues a virgin tragedy an orphan muse." The next page begins a four-page dedication to George Washington. George Washington and Mercy Otis Warren were frequent correspondents. So, on May 18, 1790, Mercy wrote to George Washington from her home in Plymouth, Sir, though it is my wish to prefix the enclosed dedication to a volume prepared for the press, I would not take this liberty without first asking your permission. The work contains two tragedies and some miscellaneous pieces written several years since a subscription has been advertised, and it will be committed to the press as soon as I have the honor of your reply. 
The enclosed dedication she refers to is dated May 1st, 1790, and with minor changes was published as the dedication to poems under the heading to George Washington, President of the United States of America. The first paragraph reads, ambitious to avoid both the style and the sentiment of common dedication, more frequently the incense of adulation and the result of truth, I only ask the illustrious Washington to permit a lady of his acquaintance to introduce to the public under his patronage a small volume written as the amusement of solitude at a period when, when every active member of society was engaged, either in the field or the cabinet, to resist the strong hand of foreign domination. And the last, Feeling much for the distresses of America in the dark days of her affliction, a faithful record has been kept of the most material transactions through a period that has engaged the attention both of the philosopher and the politician. And if life is spared, a just trait of the most distinguished characters, either for valor, virtue, or patriotism, for perversity, intrigue, inconsistency, or ingratitude, shall be faithfully transmitted to posterity by one who unites in the general wish that you, sir, may continue to preside in the midst of your brethren until nature asks the aid of retirement and repose to tranquilize the last stages of human life. Washington responded to Mercy's May 18th letter on June 4th, 1790. We are lucky enough to have this letter in the Institute's library collections to go along outside our copy of poems. Madam, I did not receive before the last mail the letter, the letter wherein you favored me with a copy of the dedication which you propose affixing to a work preparing for publication. Although I have ever wished to avoid being drawn into public view more than was essentially necessary for public purposes, yet on the present occasion, duly sensible of the merits of the respectable and amiable writer, I shall not hesitate to accept the intended honor. With only leisure to thank you for your indulgent sentiments and to wish that your work may meet with the encouragement, which I have no doubt it deserves, I hasten to present the compliments of Mrs. Washington and to subscribe myself with great esteem and regard. With this publication, Mercy became the third American woman after Anne Bradstreet and Phyllis Wheatley to publish a book of poetry with her name. The dramatic poems or plays within this volume, unlike her previous satirical works, were written to be performed by an audience and are written in blank verse. And at one time in 1787, three years before publication, Mercy even attempted to have one of them performed in London, to which John Adams replied that nothing American sells in London. The Sack of Rome, originally dedicated to John Adams, but the dedication was removed for the 1790 publication, was first written in 1787. It is based on the classic, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and dramatizes the fall of Rome. Within Roman walls, Emperor Valentinian is destroying the way of life while outside the Vandals wreak havoc. The most complex roles in this play, however, are given to the women attempting to restore their city to peace with their virtue. The women in her plays are creating and preserving virtue for prosperity. This idea is brought up again in The Ladies of Castile when the protagonist, Maria, says, virtue must spring from the maternal line. Her goals for the play are outlined in her 1790 introduction. In tracing the rise, the character, the revolutions, and the full of the most politic and brave, the most insolent and selfish people the world ever exhibited, the hero and the moralist may find the most sublime examples of valor and virtue, and the philosopher the most humiliating lessons to the pride of man and the turpitude of some of their capital characters. My first wish is to throw a mite into the scale of virtue, and my highest ambition to meet the approbation of the ju judicious and worthy. In the one, I am gratified from the reflections of my own heart. For the other, I wait with diffidence the determinations of the candid public. The Ladies of Castile, which is regarded as the better of the two dramas and one of Alexander Hamilton's favorites from the book, was originally written in 1784 at the bequest of her son Winslow and set in Spain in the 16th century. Ladies focuses on the two contrasting widows, 
Donna Maria and Donna Luisa, who both lose their patriot husbands to the conflict. Donna Maria acts courageously in Mercy's opinion to continue her husband's fight for liberty after his death. She refuses to wail in vulgar grief or meet a lingering death beneath a tyrant's foot. On the other hand, Donna Luisa dies by suicide, the more cowardly choice according to Mercy, overtaking on the mantle of her husband. In the introduction to the play, written to Winslow, Mercy writes, I have recurred to an ancient story in the annals of Spain in her last struggles for liberty, previous to the complete establishment of despotism by the family of Ferdinand. The nations have now resheathed the sword. The European world is hushed in peace. America stands alone. May she long stand independent of every foreign power, superior to the spirit of intrigue or the corrupt principles of usurpation that may spring from the successful exertions of her own sons. May their conduct never contradict the professions of the patriots who have asserted the rights of human nature, nor cause a blush to pervade the cheek of the children of the martyrs who have fallen in defense of the liberties of their country. The poetry in this book was written in the two decades before publication, with some of the earliest being from 1774. Her poetry encompasses a wide range of themes, politics, religion, and devotionals, elegies, and advice. But overall, Mercy's work published before, in, and after this publication are about freedom, liberty, and virtue for the burgeoning country and for women. In a piece written about Mercy's private poems, author Edmund Hayes notes that, Warren's appeal is almost always to reason and logic. One does not read her for lyric beauty, or for the well-turned image. Possessing a deep knowledge of the political and religious issues of her day and wishing to voice her opinions on the changes occurring around her, Warren expressed her views in poems that are clear, precise, and tightly controlled. She wrote for intellectuals and such leading American figures such as John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Elbridge Gerry, and George Washington. There are 18 miscellaneous poems in this collection. The two that I'm going to highlight are both political and comment on social customs. The Squabble of the Sea Nymphs, or The Sacrifice of the Tuscarose, and the last poem in the book, The Genius of America Weeping the Absurd Follies of the Day. The Squabble of the Sea Nymphs, a satirical allegory of the Boston Tea Party, was written based on a request from John Adams through her husband, James Warren. On December 22, 1773, Adams wrote, Make my compliments to Mrs. Warren and tell her that I want a poetical genius to describe a late frolic among the sea nymphs and goddesses. Mercy wrote the poem, and John Adams was so pleased with it that he had it published in the Boston Gazette. Adams wrote again to James Warren on April 9, 1774, that the poem was one of the most incontestable evidences of real genius which has yet been exhibited, for to take the clumsy, indigested conception of another and work it into so elegant and classical a composition requires genius equal to that which wrought another most beautiful poem. Here, Adams is referring to the poem, The Rape of the Lock, written by Alexander Pope, which Mercy had taken great inspiration from. In poems, Sea Nymphs is prefaced with the following. The important political events of 1774, when several cargoes of tea were poured into the sea, has been replete with mighty consequences and will never be forgotten in the history of American independence. But the author's own opinion of the equity or policy of this measure is not to be collected from a political sally, written at the request of a particular friend, now in one of the highest grades of American rank. Like many of her poems, Mercy also slips in commentary regarding women in politics, writing, for females have their influence o'er kings, nor wives nor mistresses were useless things, even to the gods of ancient Homer's page, then sure in this polite and polished age, none will neglect the sex's sage advice when they engage in any point so nice as to forbid the choice nectarous sip and offer buoy to the rosy lip. This passage implies that wives and mothers influence men through their virtue by shaping men's manners and political values in private. 
A second political poem in the collection was originally published in 1778, and it's the last poem of the collection titled, The Genius of America Weeping the Absurd Follies of the Day, October 10th, 1778. Originally published in the Boston Gazette on October 5th, 1778. This poem was written in response to the changing political climate in the late 1770s. James Warren hadn't been reelected to the Massachusetts House the first time since 1766, which the Warrens attributed to John Hancock. By the late 1770s, Hancock had become an enemy of the Warrens who distrusted his materialism, wealth, and pandering to the people of Boston. Mercy and her peers were concerned with the hoarding and smuggling of goods, displaying a selfishness that, in her opinion, was detrimental to the revolutionary cause and to the future of the country. The poem begins with, O tempora, or mores, or O the times, O the customs. Mercy reflected that the piece was written when a most remarkable depravity of manners pervaded the cities of the United States, in consequence of a state of war, a relaxation of government, the sudden acquisition of fortune, a depreciating currency, and a new intercourse with foreign nations. Mercy longed for virtue, which she felt was being betrayed by the nouveau riche who thrived on materialism. Much of the poem explores this idea. For example, who grasps the dregs of base oppressive gains while luxury and high profusion reigns. Our country bleeds and bleeds at every pore, yet gold's the deity whom all adore, except a few whose probity of soul no bribe could purchase nor no fears control. Warren's personal losses before the publication of this book influenced her writing of the elegies featured in the collection. Her brother and confidant, Jemmy, had suffered from mental illness throughout his life, and a blow to the head during an altercation with a crown officer in 1769 had left him disabled and out of public life, eventually dying in 1783 after being struck by lightning. Her sister, Mary Otis Gray, died in 1763, and her son, Charles, died in 1785 of tuberculosis at the age of 23. The poem written a year after Charles' untimely death, titled Lines Written on the Anniversary of the Death of Mr. C.W., an amiable and accomplished young gentleman who died in St. Lazar, 1785. The poem acknowledges the pain felt by Mercy and James while also communicating their acceptance and knowledge of Charles' virtue. Oh, lend a moment to a parent's grief as wounded nature asks this kind relief. Long have I trod o'er life's most brilliant stage, read its deceptive visionary page. Its richest hope in rapture lifted high, I now survey with retrospective eye. Its brightest boon, oft my transported heart, in fancy hugged, but time's insidious dart. Checked each fond wish, relentless swept sweat away, as tender foliage in a frosty day. Youth, vigor, friendship, and the ripening bloom of early genius, shrewds, and sees tomb. Other elegies in the collection include a comforting note to Abigail Adams titled, To an Amiable Friend Mourning the Death of an Excellent Father, and an elegy for her dear friend, John Winthrop, on the death of the Honorable John Winthrop Esquire, and addressed to his lady, Hannah Winthrop, another one of Mercy's close friends and correspondents. The book was sent to a number of her peers and she received glowing reviews. In our library collection, we have the letter that Hamilton wrote Mercy in acknowledgement of receiving and reading the book. It contains one of the most quoted lines about Mercy's genius. Madam, in making you thus late my acknowledgments for the honor you did me by presenting me with a volume of your poems, I dare not attempt an apology for the delay. I can only throw myself upon your clemency for a pardon. I have not, however, been equally delinquent towards the work itself, which I have read more than once with great interest. It is certain that in the Ladies of Castile, the sex will find a new occasion of triumph. Not being a poet myself, I am in the less danger of feeling mortification at the idea that in the career of dramatic composition at least, female genius in the United States has outstripped the male. 
With great consideration and esteem, I have the honor to be, Madame, your most obedient and humble servant, A. Hamilton. After the publication of poems, Mercy turned her attention to finishing and publishing what most regard as her magnum opus, History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution, a three-volume set published in 1805. She was 75 and would be one of the first American women to publish a nonfiction work. We have the three volumes in our own library collection. Mercy had been working on this publication since the start of the war, understanding the global awareness and impact of the American Revolution. She had insider status and information that other historians wouldn't have been privy to by asking her peers for their personal accounts of the war, as well as any documentation. Through her writing of this history, she burned some bridges, including the Adamses, from whom they were already somewhat estranged due to their differing political leanings. Her publication of Observation had betrayed John's Federalist ideals, and this publication only further exemplified their ideological rift. Despite this, she did not shy away from criticizing anyone she felt betrayed the ideals of the revolution. It is a comprehensive history where she analyzes and assesses the war and includes character pieces that shed light on the leaders. History, however, did not gain the critical acclaim that poems had and was largely ignored by reviews. Today, it's regarded as an essential contemporary account of the American Revolution. Mercy died in 1814 at the age of 86. Her legacy, however, has lived on. Her publications shaped the Patriot cause during the war and continue to affect revolutionary memory today. She fulfilled her Republican motherhood by writing and sharing her experiences from during and after the war. Elizabeth Ellett, one of the first American historians of women and the author of The Women of the Revolution, first published in 1848, features Mercy Otis Warren. She wrote, the name Mercy Warren belongs to American history. In the influence she exercised, she was perhaps the most remarkable woman who lived at the revolutionary period. In more modern times, Mercy's statue was placed in front of the Barnstable Courthouse in 2001 beside her brother. We are so lucky to have in our collections the Hamilton and Washington Letters, two of the library's earliest acquisitions, which were gifted in 1947 by a descendant of James and Mercy. We acquired history in the 1970s and poems just this past November in 2021 as part of the Robert Charles Lawrence Ferguson Collection, which specializes in collecting works related to the theory and practice of the art of war in the revolutionary era. The letters are available to view on our digital library. Well, thank you, Rachel, for that excellent presentation and for uh, helping us to realize the importance of this trailblazing woman of the American Revolution. Uh, now, before we conclude this program today, I would like to invite you to our next historical program that will be our first in-person program since March of 2020. This program will be held here at Anderson House on Tuesday, April 12th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and will feature historian Christian Despina discussing Dr. Joseph Warren, a lecture that accompanies our new exhibition, Saving Soldiers, Medical Practice in the Revolutionary War. Registration is currently open for that program, along with all of our other future historical programs. Additionally, for those of you who wish to continue tuning in to our programs from afar, rest assured that we do have you covered. We are continuing to offer access to all of our forthcoming in-person programs by streaming them live on Zoom. If you wish to join us virtually, simply click the virtual access link when you go to register through the event page on our website. We look forward to being able to offer our programs to our broader audience, as well as welcoming attendees back into our ballroom here at Anderson House. So with that, on behalf of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, thank you all again for joining us today and for your continued support of our mission. I wish you all a great afternoon. Until next time, take care. <laughs>